Okay, being that the 4th of July is only a day away, I figured I would bring out a few examples of my G.I. Joe rifles for a little show and tell. For those of you who don't instantly recognize this weapon, this is the U.S. rifle, caliber 30 M1. Uh, sometimes referred to as the Garand, and yes, that's how I pronounce it, Garand. I know there's a lot of people that pronounce it differently, but every single GI I know who didn't call this rifle simply the M1 called it the Garand. So I'm sorry, John Garand, you're just going to have to change your name. And John Garand, by the way, was Canadian. However, he invented this rifle for Springfield Armory and uh, did a magnificent job with it. So we, we've adopted him as our own. Sorry, Canada. And this is the rifle that soldiered on all across Europe in World War II, the South Pacific against the Japanese. And later on, this is the rifle that fought the North Koreans in the Korean conflict. The three I have here today, this one is 1943, 1944, and International Harvester Corporation. I believe that's 1953, but I'm not entirely sure, I forget. And we have a few bayonets with them. We have the US model 1905. This is the 16 inch blade on there, 1942 in this case. Uh, later on, many of them were cut down a 10 inch to match that one. There are a lot of reproductions out there of these. Be very careful when you buy one. These are not reproductions. I don't collect reproductions of US military weapons. That's the 10 inch version. Don't want to get stuck with that. And here we have the older model 1905. You can see with the nice wooden handle on there. That's actually Springfield Armory 1910, Springfield Arsenal. And these were issued along with the Garands also because they used what they had and they had a lot of these on hand. Now the US rifle caliber 30 M1 fires from an eight shot N block clip. That's 30 out six or US M2 ball. 147 grain full metal case. These are dummy rounds, no powder, fired primer. We don't play with live ammo when we're making YouTube videos with our rifles. Now this would be inserted into the weapon entirely. All eight rounds would be fired, and then just a metal clip, bing, will be fired, ejected right out of it. There's YouTube videos showing that in action, so I'm not gonna bother doing it here. Sounds like that. Now, U.S. rifles were continually being rebuilt. We designed them that way, particularly the M1 Garand. This was intended to have a service life of at least 20 years, although it sold it on a bit further than that. So it was designed to have an easily changed barrel. Parts interchangeability was perfect. This is all as you would expect from the first world economy when they make a rifle. And this is, this is it. You know, when that uh, rifle reached a certain degree of wear, the barrel was simply replaced. We didn't screw around with counter boring or anything like that. If you see that on a Garand, you can be sure it was done in a foreign country, not here. See where the clip goes? Right in there. Press down. Boom. Forward. You're loaded. You got eight rounds in there. Now, one of the stories I remember somebody telling me, it was a GI, I know that, about the South Pacific. Now, the U.S. Marine Corps was initially armed with the five-shot model 1903 Springfield before they were issued Garands. This was early 1942. They would fire, you know, only five rounds out of those, and the Japanese got used to that. Well, later on, the Marine Corps was issued the M1 Garand rifle. So what they would do, and this is kind of sneaky, they would fire five rounds. Then they would stop. The Japanese would assume they were reloading, so they would jump up out of their foxholes and charge the Americans, and that's when they'd get the extra three rounds right in the gut. Eventually, the Japanese caught on, they even tried to reproduce their own version of this weapon unsuccessfully. Another story I recall being told by more than one GI, one from the Korean era and another from uh, World War II, was in the winter of 1944, and again during the uh, winter of 1950. Sometimes if ice got down in here, it would freeze up the breach. And the way to cure that problem when you have no means of warming the weapon, no fire, no hot water, is simply to pee on the weapon, urinate on the weapon, which they did. And I've had more than one GI tell me that, so I'm gonna take that as gospel that they weren't just exaggerating for my benefit. I guess if the situation was really desperate and you needed a weapon that worked, 
you do it too. Although I imagine there was an interesting smell coming off of these for some time after that happened. Here we have a cartridge belt. This is your typical 10 round, I'm sorry, 10 pocket GI cartridge belt. This particular one was made for the 1903 rifle. It has a two pocket, two, uh, it has a pocket divider in there. But the clips for the M1 Garand, they go right in there. Oops, no problem, they fit. At least they do when I'm not doing it one-handed, but these things used to be like 10 bucks each, so I collected a bunch. I don't generally collect equipment, but I figure for $10, why not buy 10 of them, which I did. All right, uh, let's take a look at this one. This one, with its barrel dated, uh, I believe that's 53, but uh, that one's a former DCM rifle, Director of Civilian Marksmanship. That was the precursor to what the, C the CMP is today. Basically, you joined a rifle club, you sent off your little check to Uncle Sam, and he sent you an M1 rifle for your rifle practice. Usually, uh, this one, I believe, was uh, issued in the 1960s through the DCM. I ended up with it in the 80s when the last owner of it passed on. And, of course, the International Harvester Corporation. Yes, that's the same International Harvester Corporation that makes trucks and bulldozers and buses and all that, that kind of stuff. But the situation was such that uh, they had to be contracted to make rifles along with H&R during the Korean War because we had to supply not only ourselves but the South Korean military with weapons. So we needed some extras and they took up the slack along with Springfield Armory. This particular rifle is a rarity among Garands. It is an actual GI bring home. I bought this from the veteran who carried this during the Korean conflict. And it is entirely matching. It has the line materials barrel still on it. It has the H&R bolt, which was correct for this particular uh, International Harvester. International Harvester had its share of teething problems getting started, so sometimes H&R had to step in with some extra parts now and then. But eventually they did get, they did get it together. And it's uh, not, not really normal to see too many bring homes from that particular war of U.S. weapons, because unlike the First World War, when it was, you want your rifle, go ahead, take it home. I imagine he probably had to sneak that home somehow. I didn't ask him the details. I was just glad enough to, to have it. And it definitely wasn't one of my cheaper Garands, Garand purchases anyway. And I think I ended up with nine of these altogether. I have a Winchester. I have an H&R. I didn't bring them all out here today because the table simply won't hold that much. And I don't feel like standing here all night showing you each and every one of them. You've seen the three, you've seen them all. And there's not a whole lot of difference in them, except the name stamped on them on the end of the uh, receiver. And I'm not going to bore you with production totals and drawing numbers and matching this and that. I never got into that. I don't collect U.S. service weapons for that reason. I don't care if it's got the original gas trap you know, on it or the original World War II sights or whatever like that. Uncle updated all of his rifles continuously, like I said before, so you're always going to have most of the updates when you get them. I bought these for the history. All right, This is the rifle uh, you know, that fought across North Africa. This is the rifle that hit the beaches of Normandy, that fought across France. You know, this is the rifle that defended the perimeter of Poussin. This is the rifle that landed at Inchon and fought its way to the Yalu River before being turned back to Inchon again. But uh, it's G.I. Joe's rifle. Anybody that's seen all of the many, many movies about World War II and documentaries on the cable TV and all that stuff, you've seen this rifle probably 400 times in each one of them. Now, everybody had one in my family who fought during the Second World War. They all had the M1 Garand, except for a couple officers who had 45s or M1 carbines. Uh, even John, even uh, George Patton had an M1 Garand. He called it the, the greatest battle implement ever devised. I doubt he did much fighting with it, but he did actually have one. And it is an extremely, extremely good weapon. You know, and it didn't have really any teething problems as a lot of new designs have, except for the gas trap thing, which was taken care of before the Second World War even started. And we used this from 36 to 57. It soldiered on with a lot of our allies well beyond that. You know, State Guard units were using these into the 1970s. The South Korean military ended up with a lot of these, and the South, Korean, uh, the South Vietnamese did as well. And they were used all over South America, You'll find them doing honor guard duty today and parade duty and uh, 
oh, let's not even forget national match use. A lot of guys shoot competition with these rifles. And it definitely is an extremely good tool for that if you have the skill. I'm not one of those dead-eye shooters. I plink. I don't, you know, do competitions, all of that stuff. But if I did, any one of these rifles would definitely fit the bill for that. And I also don't collect reproductions or rifles that have been altered for use in competition. We put heavy barrels, all of that stuff. I, I don't get into that. Because they do make reproductions of the M1 Garand today. You can get one, I believe, the Australians make a receiver for it, uh, Fulton Armory and Springfield Armory. They, they uh, had them for a bit. They probably still do. Uh, that's not my thing. If you want a shooter, yeah, great, fine. You know, they'll shoot like any Garand, but the history's not there in the reproductions. And so it just doesn't do anything for me. I say, eh, you know, who cares? I, I don't get involved with that. Any more than I get involved with that matching number crap where guys run around trying to match the individual drawing numbers. Drawing numbers kind of like a serial number on each individual part. It really just tells a particular time period when, when a, a part like, say, the trigger group or whatever was made. And they try to match that to the month the rifle was made. Ah, you know what? That's not how the arsenal did business. They used whatever parts were at hand at that time, and when those parts were gone, they acquired new ones. They didn't care if the receiver was made in 1942 and the part was made in 1938. They were going to use it anyway. And that's, you know, after the war and during the war, they were constantly, constantly refurbishing these rifles. That meant they just took the whole thing apart, threw the parts in a big barrel, phosphated each one of them individually, put the rifle back together again with a new barrel or whatever at the end of it, and that's how they issued it, because they had perfect parts interchangeability. They didn't care, you know? This is not like Europe, where they put serial numbers to match the receiver on every little part like the Germans do. Who gives a damn about that? You could sit down at a table, and I have done this as an experiment. I don't recommend doing this. I've taken, you know, the go, no, go headspace gauges and swapped around bolts to see if they would still pass. Everyone did perfectly. No matter what, all nine. Didn't, didn't matter what combination I did. That doesn't always work out well with Mausers or even Mosin rifles or Enfields or anything like that. Most other countries' rifles, you're going to run into a problem if you try to do that. You're going to fail headspace, so it'll be too tight or something like that. Never had a problem like that with the M1 Garand. Every part interchanges perfectly. It's really impressive. And expected of a first world economy. That's how we do things in this country. You know, we uh, don't uh, mess around with the weapons. Don't, didn't do it then, didn't, don't do it now. Well, that's G.I. Joe's rifle for you on this day before the 4th. I hope you enjoyed it, and I uh, hope you have an opportunity, if you don't already own one, I hope you have the opportunity to own one one day. And if you want to, check out the CMP. They still have them. Uh, some of them probably are World War II issue and such. I believe they do grade them. And you can take a look at those, because you're going to have a hard time finding a private sale one these days, because guys like me, we, we have to be dead to sell these. We really don't just part with them that easily. And there you go. Happy 4th, everyone.